in my hand? God's divinely inspired word. And I'm going to hide God's word in my heart that I might not sin against him. Amen. Open to 3 John. Uh, we are finishing up our series in the epistles of John. This will be the last sermon. We come to this third letter of John, a little letter here, but it has a great message to it. And I want to preach this morning on the prosperous soul. And so let me ask you a question. Are you interested in being prosperous? I hope you are because God wants to prosper you. We serve such a gracious and good God, and he wants you to be prosperous. Just write down Psalm 35, verse 27. Let the Lord be magnified, which has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. So God delights in our prosperity. He delights when you prosper. Now, when we say the word prosper, however, a lot of people, when they think of that, they think of perhaps owning a mansion and having a fleet of Cadillacs and you know, cornering the market on stocks and bonds and securities. But that's not necessarily what we mean here when we talk about being prosperous, although God does provide so well for us. You know, there's a, there's a gospel out there called the Health, Wealth, and Prosperity Gospel that basically says, you know, it's God's will for everyone to be a millionaire, and if you're ever sick a day in your life, it's not God's will. But friend, when people preach that, I often wonder, have they forgotten about the Old Testament prophets? Many of them were poor and they suffered physical illness. In the New Testament, the apostles, the disciples uh, didn't have a whole lot of this world's goods and they had to suffer uh, a lot. The apostle Paul had a thorn in the flesh. And so that's not what it's saying. God does prosper us. He does give us material things. He does bless us with good things. But sometimes it is God's will for us to be sick because in the scripture, God used it for his own glory. And sometimes God will allow us to go through a poverty cycle in our life that we might learn to trust him and to know that every good and perfect gift is from above. So what is John talking about when he talks about prosperity here? That's really his theme here. He's talking about really the prosperous soul. In fact, look at verse number two. He says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper. And be in health even as thy soul prosperous. He's writing to his friend, a man by the name of Gaius, and he makes this prayer. I hope that you, your body prospers as well as your soul is prospering. Think about that. I hope that your body prospers as well as your soul is prospering. It's worth pondering. If someone prayed that for you or me, would it be a blessing or would it be a curse? Where we have to call the paramedics, you know. I hope that your body prospers the way that your soul does. Is your soul prospering? That's the question. And so really, that's what John's referring to. Look in verse 4. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. John is describing a spiritual prosperity. And isn't that true? Doesn't it bring joy when our children walk in truth? Now, I know that John is speaking here about his spiritual children, those who know the Lord Jesus Christ. And just let me say that that brings us great joy. That brings our founding pastor, Pastor Johnson, and all of the pastors on this staff and myself. It brings us tremendous joy to see people walking in truth and their soul prospering and seeing the blessing of God on their life. That's what we live for. This is true, of course, of a parent. All of us as parents, we want our children to know the Lord Jesus we want them to love Jesus, to embrace the message of the cross. But what John is describing here is a prosperous soul. Now, let me give you a little background into the letter again, kind of set it up. Of course, we know John is the writer. He wrote 1 John and 2 John. He is the apostle. And he wrote a similar letter. If you were with us two weeks ago, 2 John, this is a very personal letter. This is written to a person. John wrote 2 John to a lady, and here he's writing 3 John, to a man by the name of Gaius, as I said before. Now, who is this? We don't really know a lot about Gaius. His name is mentioned three times in the New Testament. We don't think it's the same person, however. This is a very popular name. But more importantly, what's the purpose behind the letter? The purpose here is the purpose of commendation. Now, again, remember, this is a personal letter. And so he's writing to this man, and the key words are love and truth. We saw that in 2 John, same kind of, same kind of wording to love the truth, to walk in truth and love. He uses the same expressions here. Now, remember, in 2 John, John was writing to an elect lady. He doesn't give the name of the woman. 
But I think it was in response perhaps to a question she had about receiving traveling missionaries. Because she was trying to be hospitable and she was receiving missionaries, but some of them were not true preachers of God. And they weren't preaching the same message of Christ. And so John warns her. He says, you better be careful that you don't welcome in someone that's not preaching the orthodox truth about Jesus. By doing that, you're basically becoming partaker of their evil deeds. So don't even bid them Godspeed when they come to the door. Now, in 3 John, John again is dealing with the issue of hospitality. However, here in 3 John, he's dealing with it from a more positive light. In 2 John, he dealt with hospitality from a negative light. Be careful who you help and who you receive. Here in 3 John, he is commending Gaius because he was also hospitable, and he would help out and receive traveling missionaries. And John is saying, look, I want to encourage you to keep doing that, especially in light of the fact that there are others who weren't doing this. And there's another man that we're going to learn about who was discouraging this. And so this is a book of commendation. John is commending Gaius for what he was doing, but it's also a letter of recommendation. You say, now what is that? You know, every once in a while, um, a, a, an evangelist or a missionary or even a preacher will call me and they'll say, hey, could you write me a letter of recommendation? And they want this letter of recommendation because perhaps they're trying to uh, get approved for a position or they want to, you know, have opportunities, open doors. And by me writing a letter of recommendation, I'm basically saying to anyone, I know this person, I know their character, I know that they walk with God, and, and I bear record that they are a man, this person is a man of God, and you should use this person. Just a basic letter of recommendation. Now, that's nothing new. Did you know that they did that all the way back in the early church? And this is what 3 John basically is. It's a letter of recommendation. John is writing to Gaius, and he's recommending that he receive a man by the name of Demetrius. We see his name at the end of the letter. Look in verse number 12. Demetrius hath a good report of all men and of the truth itself. Yea, and we also bear record and you know that our record is true. John says, look, I bear record of him, and you know me. I'm not going to tell you anything that's not true. And so I recommend to you Demetrius. Now, why were these letters important? Because you have to remember that these traveling missionaries, when they would you know, go and spread the gospel and take the word of God, they would travel those Roman roads, you know, those roads that were built all throughout the Roman Empire. They would hit those Roman roads, and they were going to these strategic places sharing Christ, but they never stayed in hotels or inns because they were not good places to stay. They were dependent upon the hospitality of Christians. But here's a question. If a person, say you lived back then, and someone came knocking on your door at twilight one night, and they said, hey, I, I need some hospitality. I'm a missionary. I am a preacher. I'm sharing Christ, and I see that you're a Christian. I can see by the emblem on your door, the little sign that you have, that you know the Lord Jesus. And um, can I have hospitality tonight? So you have a decision to make. Are you going to receive this person? Or perhaps they would go to a church and talk to a pastor. Hey, we're traveling. Can your church help me? Well, the question was, how do we know that this person was really of God? Well, they would sometimes pull out a letter of recommendation. And they would say something like this. Do you know John, the apostle John? Oh, yeah, we know John. Well, here's a letter from John. And so this letter of recommendation helped to discern between those that were good and those who were not. And if you received a letter of recommendation from John, what would you do if you were living back then? Oh, absolutely, I'll help you. Any friend of John is a friend of mine, and we will absolutely help you. There was a problem, however. There was a man in a certain church and his name is Diotrephes. If you look down in verse number 9, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminent among them, among them, received them not. There was one man that was blocking this whole process. He was a stubborn, self-willed, egotistical person who didn't want to receive whoever John recommended because he was in competition with John, and so he wouldn't receive him. And so this created a problem. And so what John is doing in this letter is he's commending Gaius. Now, so far, Gaius 
has resisted the strong arm tactics of Diotrephes. You have to imagine that these two are in the same church and Gaius is accustomed to receiving God's servants and sending them away and helping them out. But he's having a lot of pressure from Diotrephes to no longer receive whoever John sends. And so there's a little problem here. And John addresses this in the letter. But what I want you to see in the overall message of the letter is this. The, really what we see are the characteristics of a prosperous soul because that's what John's doing here. And what we see are these three characters and lessons we can learn about our soul prospering. So let me give these to you here. If you're taking notes, just write down number one. Look, write down Gaius. And what, what do we learn from him? A prosperous soul walks in love and in truth. And that's what he was doing. He was walking in love and truth. He was lovable. Look in verse number five. Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers. He's saying, Gaius, you have been doing good. You have been showing hospitality and love. And remember, this is a very important thing in the early church. The Bible says that Elders or pastors were to be hospitable. If you weren't hospitable, you couldn't be a pastor. Peter said to be hospitable without complaining. Someone comes to you and they need your hospitality. You just receive them and don't complain about it. Just do it under the Lord. This was something that was very important. Now, Gaius, he was doing that. He was bringing in these guys. He was taking care of them, giving them a meal, giving them a place to stay. And then he would load them down with supplies before they left. He was just a very loving, good faithful person, and people loved him. John loved him. John called him his well-beloved in verse number one, and John commends him because, again, he's walking in truth, and notice where he says, my own children, my, my child, he says, I think that Gaius was someone that John led to the Lord, and now John's watching him as he's just being loving, and he's helping out the truth. He's helping out the missionary effort, and John just loves that. You know, one of the things that we love most is people that we lead to Jesus and watch them grow. You know, a lot of you invited people here last week. Wouldn't it be wonderful to see them come to know Christ and then for them to walk in truth? Boy, that's joyous. That's wonderful. This is what John is saying. He was loved by John. He was loved by other believers in verse 3. I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee. John said, look, there were some brethren that came from you. You treated them so good and you loaded them down and you blessed them and they came and they told me all about it. The brethren came to me, and they told me what you were doing. He was loved by other believers. Very hospitable. He was spiritual in verse number 2. John says, I want your body to prosper as well as your soul is. There might be a hint here in this that physically perhaps he wasn't doing very well. There may have been a physical illness that he had, and John is wishing blessings on him physically just as his soul is prospering. You know, I've known some godly Christians that physically they were sick and they were going through an illness, but you know what? Their soul prospers. They're doing well spiritually. You know, this body of ours is going to break down as we get older. But you know what the Bible says? The outward man might perish, but the inward man is what? It's renewed day by day. And so John is commending him. He was lovable. He was spiritual. He was hospitable, as we saw in verse 5 and 6. Look at verse 6. Which have borne witness of thy charity... Before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly short, thou shalt do well. John says, you know what? People are testifying of your hospitality, and you're taking care of God's servants, and you're blessing them, and you're just very hospitable. You know what the Bible says? You know what Jesus said? He who receives you receives me. He was telling his disciples this. He says to them, if they receive you, they receive me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. He who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. So you you see that? The way that you treat one of God's servants, missionaries, uh, pastors, evangelists, whatever, Jesus says, that's the way you're treating me. And if you receive him, you receive me. And if you receive me, you receive the one who sent me, you receive God. This is all important to God. By the way, let me just say, this church, you're such a loving church. I get more than I deserve with you. You receive me better than I deserve, and I want to thank you for that, for being merciful to me (laughs) and receiving me so well, and I'm grateful for that. And I thank you for loving our founding pastor and loving all of our staff 
Because by doing that, you're honoring the Lord. You're being a blessing. And that's what John is saying here. Why? Because look at verse 7. Because for th that for his name's sake, they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles. It's good that you receive them, John says, and you help them because they don't take anything from the Gentiles, meaning those who don't know Christ from the world. Let me tell you something. You know what? As a church, we don't take money from the world because it's not the world's responsibility to help us get the gospel out and fund the work of the church. In fact, what does that say of the church that the church can't fund its own missionary endeavors and we have to go to the world to help? That's not a good testimony for the church. That's why I don't like to see people out on street corners with buckets saying, I'm from thus and such church and asking for money. Friend, you'll never see that happen here because it's God's people that fund God's work for God's glory. And that's what he says here. These people, they don't take anything from the Gentiles, only from the people of God. And so John commends them. And look at verse 8. We, therefore, ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. And again, anytime you, with love, you support the work of God and you give to other servants and missionaries and people of God, you're being a fellow helper to the truth. And this is why John is commending Gaius, because he walks in love and he walks in truth. And so if you want to be a prosperous soul, you will walk in love and in truth. Secondly, next character. We already talked about Gaius. Number two, Diotrephes. Look at verse number nine again. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who love to have the preeminence among them, receives us not. You know, unfortunately, not everyone was like Gaius. And John introduces to, the, to us this character named Diotrephes. He's the exact opposite of Gaius. He hinders the truth. Whereas Gaius is a helper of the truth, Diotrephes is hindering the truth. And really, he's not prospering in his soul. Really, he's a destitute soul. And John makes five accusations here, five characteristics about Diotrephes. And here's the point. We don't want to be like him. That's the whole point here. Don't be like this guy. What's he like? Well, first, he demanded to be first in verse 9 who loves to have the preeminence. Look at the word preeminence from two Greek words, phileo, lover, protuo, first. Love to be first. He wants to be first. And therein lies the explanation for a majority of church problems throughout the history of the church. It's when people desire to be first and they put themselves above all others. That's exactly the opposite of the mind of Christ because Christ had a selfless mind. And what does the Bible say? Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. And he thought of others. He put others ahead of him. He was completely selfless. Diotrephes is not that way at all. He wants to be first. And uh, he was concerned for himself not for what was best for the gospel. And so he was a problem. Because that desire to be first, that's nothing but pride. By the way, the word preeminence, the only other time it's used in the New Testament is in reference to the Lord Jesus, talking about the preeminence of Christ. He is the head. He is to be first. Let me tell you who's to be first in the church. It's Jesus. He's first. He's preeminent. He gets the glory. That's all we're concerned about. As far as first place goes, we just want to make sure Jesus is first. But this guy here, he wants to be first. Here's another thing about him. He was defiant to authority in verse number 9. But the atrophies who loves to have the preeminence among them received us not. Another way to say this, he'll have nothing to do with us. He, John is saying he's not listening to my authority. He's not listening to me. I heard of a little boy who formed a club with his friends, as little boys have a tendency to do. And, of course, clubs like that have to have rules. And this little boy's club only had two rules that were very simple. Here's the first rule. I am the boss of this club. And rule number two, you don't boss the boss. I'm the boss and you don't boss the boss. Those were the diatrophies rules, we could say. I'm the boss of this church and you don't boss the boss. And he wouldn't receive anything from John. John had written a letter of recommendation and put it in the hands of other preachers and missionaries, and they would come to the church, 
And there would be Gaius ready to receive him, but the Atrophies would kind of push him aside and say, wait a minute, who's this letter from? This is from John. Well, we don't, we're not going to receive you. Well, this is from John the Apostle. It doesn't matter. You see, Diotrephes looked at John as a rival. He looked at him as competition. And because of that, he wouldn't receive the authority of John. And that was a mistake. You know, the Bible is our authority. And the Bible gives spiritual leaders to the church. And the Bible says we're to be submissive to that spiritual leadership. But Diotrephes wasn't. Here's the third thing. Uh, he used malicious gossip to run down his opponents. Look what it says in verse 10. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, pratting against us with malicious words, not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, forbiddeth them that would. He's using all these malicious words. The word malicious is the word paneros for evil. Uh, empty words is really how we could say it. It's a word, the root means to bubble up. You know why it calls it bubble? Because bubbles are empty. And the words they used were really just empty words, uh, just tattling, gossiping, this hallow talk. And he was using this insinuating language against John. And so here's this, this destitute soul who is using this malicious gossip to run down anyone who tries to oppose him. But here's another thing about him. He used relationships for power. It says, he, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, verse 10. And... Anyone that John recommended, he rejected. And anyone that associated with John would get rejected. And so, you know, you can see a position that Gaius is in. He's kind of in an awkward position here. Here is John saying to Gaius, receive Demetrius. And here's Diotrephes trying to put pressure on Gaius, threatening to perhaps cast him out of the church because that's what he would do in verse number 10. He says, forbiddeth them that would and casteth them out of the church. This is the next thing. He bullies others through intimidation. He would try to intimidate and threaten to cast them out if you don't do what I say, the word ekbalo, literally to toss them out. I'll toss you out of this place if you don't do what I say. That is not of God. Nowhere near it. This destitute soul bullies others through intimidation. And so what's the point here? What is John saying to Gaius? Gaius? Don't be intimidated. Look at verse 11. Beloved, talking to Gaius, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. How does, how does someone like this need to be dealt with? They just need to be confronted. And by the way, John says, when I get there, I'll take care of that. I'll confront him. I would like to have had a ringside seat for that little confrontation. John says, I'll, I'll, I'll confront him. I'll take care of him. And sometimes, unfortunately, shepherds have to deal with wolves those who would try to overrule in the church of God to the harm of others can't allow that. So here's the third person that we see here. What do we learn from Gaius? That a prosperous soul walks in truth and love. If you want to be prosperous, do what he does. Walk in truth, walk in love. A prosperous soul submits to spiritual authority. Theotrephes doesn't do that. And John is saying, look, don't be like this guy. And Gaius, don't let him intimidate you. And don't follow his example. If you want an example to follow, follow the example of Demetrius. And here's the third thing. We could say that Demetrius, what does he teach us? The prosperous soul imitates godly examples. In verse 12, Demetrius had a good report of all men and of the truth itself. Yea, and we also bear record, and you know that our record is true. And so John basically is encouraging Gaius in verse 11. Don't follow that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Hint, hint, who's he talking about there? Diotrephes. This guy hasn't seen God. He does evil. Follow that which is good. And the lesson we learn, if you want to be prosperous, imitate godly examples. That's the whole point. I thank God that we've got a lot of godly examples around here, you know, if I want to be a good pastor, I just try to do what the founding pastor did. I'm trying to walk in those footsteps there. I'm just trying to imitate what I've learned. When I was a Christian, I first got saved. I had godly examples all around here in this church to follow. You have godly examples, people who really love Jesus, who follow the Lord. You say, man, I don't know what to do as a Christian. Okay, let me tell you, just follow their example. Just do what they do. Follow their life. 
We see, you know what the word example here is? Or follow, I should say. The word follow, when he says, uh, follow not that which is evil, but follow that which is good. It is the Greek word, mimeo, which where we get the word mimic, literally, mimic. Mimic those that are good, those that are godly. We, we see this word in several places in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 4, 16. Wherefore, I beseech you, be followers of me, Paul said. Paul wasn't on an ego trip when he said that. He just said, look, if you want to know how to live, just follow my example. But Paul was simply following the example of Jesus, others before him. We're just following in the same footprints of Christ. We're following that example. That's all we're doing. Heard about an army unit that was under fire, and they had to get out of this, this field. But there was a minefield in front of them, and the sergeant came to them, and he said, Look, you guys, whatever you do, follow me, because he had remembered where they marked the mines the day before. So he said to his unit, follow whatever you do. Put your footprints in mine. Follow me. And they all very carefully marched through that field under the fog, away from the enemy, and every soldier was safe. The next day when they made a report about that whole incident, what was interesting was the guy who made the report saw, even though it was a whole platoon of soldiers, he saw only one set of footprints on that field, just one. You know what? As I look in the scripture, I only see one set of footprints that were made by Jesus. And all the others just follow in those footprints. And you know what we do? We just follow in the same set of footprints. We just imitate and follow those who are godly. If you want to be a prosperous soul, that's what you do. Because look what John says about this man. Everyone speaks well of him. Talking about Demetrius. He's recommending Demetrius for help. All men... And the truth speaks well of him. And John himself bears record about who he is. Listen, friend, I want you to prosper spiritually. God wants you to prosper spiritually. Well, that ends another service here at Grace Bible Baptist Church. For those of you who are listening for the very, very first time, we want you to know that this program is bought with a caring heart. We care about you. We want you to know the Lord Jesus Christ. We want you to know the Word of God, how that you can live and walk with Him and have an inner beauty and an inner rest that only God can give to you. Well, you must come and visit us at our church, 1518 North Rolling Road, right here in Catonsville, Maryland. You still have time to make the service. Now, you'll find a number at the end of the screen. Give us a call. We're there to help you. God bless you, and I'm looking forward to seeing you every Sunday.